Can I have your attention just for a second? It's, uh, it's five minutes before our presentation here, and I'd like to make a little uh, announcement. Um, I would invite you to linger after the presentation. Um, uh, I'd invite you to linger a few minutes after the presentation of the soloist for the symphony. Uh, her name is uh, Belle Brown, and she's a tuba player. And so she's going to come here and, and we uh, end up uh, today and just, just play a few, few selections. And of course, she's, uh, she'll be with the symphony on Sunday. And uh, actually tonight at 6.30 in the chapel, she has a, a recital and a master class for the, for the kids here. So, so I just, like I say, just, uh, you, can, you know, you can talk through her presentation, I guess. But um, but yeah, just just linger a while and uh, give her a chance to uh, get set up and uh, uh, do that. So okay, it's not quite 12 yet, right? Okay, so I'm good. I'm not interrupting anything. So okay, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Jeff grew up 
in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He attended Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and received his Master's of Library Science at the University of Pittsburgh, and a second Master's degree in Archaeology from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Jeff was a park ranger at Fort Necessity in Pennsylvania and Mesa Verde in Colorado. Regular trips to two places cultivated lifelong interests, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh and Gettysburg National Battlefield. We are so happy Jeff has decided to share some of his research with us today, so please join me in welcoming Jeff Meyer. Eighteen 
1896, Marconi machine. So Marconi, an Italian-American, invented a wireless communication device that was, it would be based off of Morse code. It's used by captains at sea. So we're going to see an example of a Marconi machine in a few minutes. What year was the telephone patented? 1876, Alexander Graham Bell. Bell Telephone. In what year could you ride a train from New York to California? We had trains uh, for several decades. However, in what year do we have the trains connected from coast to coast? 1869, I think I heard Brian say that. Yeah, 1869, the, <laughs> uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, you could go from California to New York in 1869. Now how about this? When was the first instantaneous te uh, telecommunication between the Atlantic coast and the Pacific coast? So when could somebody instantaneously hear somebody, if, if somebody was in California and you're communicating with somebody in New York City, when was the first time that this happened? Eighteen sixty one. Right on the eve of the Civil War. The trans uh, continental telegraph system had been devised. <laughs> and a really spooky message, we're gonna see what the spooky message is. The first telegraph message from California to the East Coast. Based on the primary documents, um, some of which you have in front of you that I passed out. When would folks in New York City and California hear about Arabella Bad Mansfield in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, passing the bar exam? What year? She passed the bar exam in 1869. In what year did people in New York City and way out in California hear about this? 1869, the same year she took it. So now we have a timeline that kind of puts all this together. On the one border, we have 1837, Samuel Morris invents the telegraph. On the other end, we have the wireless, 1896, Marconi machine. Right in between these inventions is the 1860s. The Civil War happened. The Transcontinental Railroad happened. The, the telegraph happened. Arabella passes the bar exam. Arabella's brother goes to the Civil War. And here is uh, Samuel Morse, the inventor of the telegraph, and as some people would say, the inventor of computer information, uh, instantaneous communication. Uh, Western Union, which was like Verizon in the 19th century. So <laughs> Western Union uh, had uh, telegraph stations all over the world, and um, in the data here is from a, uh, this is from a Western Union pamphlet from 1869. The data though is 1866, the year Arabella graduated from Iowa Wesley. In Austria, there are 856 uh, telegraph stations. They had 74,000 miles of telegraph wire. And Austrians sent two and a half million telegraph messages. And there was about one telegraph uh, station per 50,000 people. A telegraph station in 1866 would be like an internet cafe in the year 2000. You know, most people didn't have access to these things unless they went to some public place. And so this would be like, there would be one telegraph station in Iowa City population. Something like that to compare. It'd be like if there was one internet cafe in Iowa City in the year 2000. And then in France, uh, they have more stations. They had 1,200 stations, 70,000 miles of wire. Almost 3 million messages were sent in France. There was one station per every 30,000 people. So it'd be like Burlington, you know, one uh, internet cafe in Burlington. There's one telegraph station and 30,000 people. 
Britain doubles it. Britain in 1866 has over 2,000 telegraph stations. They have 80,000 miles of wire, and people in Britain sent almost 6,000 messages that year through telegraph. There was one tel uh, telegraph station for every 13,000 people. So London, you can imagine, was a big city, would have multiple telegraph stations that people could go in. Uh, the, the telegraph is it's been described as Victorian email, and that's why I'm using the, uh, the, 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 uh, the synonym of an internet cafe. You need to contact somebody a long way away. Think about it. You're, you're using an electronic device. Electrons are moving over a copper wire. It's a binary code. The binary code uh, is going to be transmitting a sound by uh, beep. Beep, 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 beep. There's either a sound or there isn't a sound. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll break down what a bit is in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, but they're using an electronic device for instantaneous long distance telecommunications. It's essentially electronic mail. They're using email in the 19th century. In the USA, we beat them all. 4,000 stations, 125,000 miles of wire. Now we have the biggest space to cover. Americans sent 13 million telegraphs in 1866. There are about 30 million people in the United States in 1866. One out of every two people sent a telegraph statistically in 1866. Even if you include little kids, and remember in the 1860s, there'd be a lot of little kids. So you get rid of the little kids, probably almost every adult sent something statistically through telegraph. And there'd be one telegraph station per every 7,000 people. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to communicate and relay messages. Um, and then uh, before we get too, too much into it, I, I brought some, I'll go back over here to you. I'll come back over here so you can hear me. Okay. I have a light bulb, also from the 1870s. So Arabella is living in an incredible time. This is patented in the 1870s, the same time as the telephone. Uh, telephone telegraph services are in business. A light bulb and a telegraph are both one bit electronic devices. There's either electrons moving through it or there isn't. And if there's electrons moving through it, the light bulb turns on. On Samuel Morris's machine, whenever you tap the device, that's going to close a circuit. Electrons are going to move, and it's going to make a beep. And just like a light bulb, it's like turning a light bulb on and off. A light bulb is a one-bit device. And if we have two light bulbs, we have a two-bit system. There are four possibilities. Both of these light bulbs could be turned on at the same time, or both of them could be off, or this one could be on, or this one could be on. There's four opportunities. If we add this up, if we keep adding light bulbs, if we say have eight light bulbs, we now have 256 possibilities. And those of you using an Apple II computer in the 80s or an Atari <coughs> or using an 8-bit system, 256 processes, because if you think of it, there's eight light bulbs lined up. How many different options are there? They could all be lit up, none of them could be lit up. The first one could be lit up, but none of the other ones. And if you go look down the line, there are 256 combinations. The laptop that I'm using right now is 64 bit, and that's pretty standard. 64 bit. And the way that uh, electronics are is it, it just compounds. It's exponential power. And those of you, I mean, over the last few decades, you've seen what computers have done. This all began with Samuel Morse with a one-bit system, and it's gone now to a 64-bit system. There's 18.5 quintillion combinations that a computer can do. And that's why we can have all these pictures up here. You know, Samuel Morse was more limited, but it's the beginning. 
This is an 1858 illustration. This is when the transatlantic telegraph cable was set between the United States and Great Britain. So the English-speaking world is communicating across the Atlantic Ocean instantaneously. So in New York City, you could send a message to London. Now it had to be fixed a couple times. You know, this is a big project. So you have two ships that met in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. One was American and one was British. They met in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. They both have a cable. They drop the cable in and they sail back to their respective countries. And as they sail, the cable goes into the Atlantic Ocean, down to the bottom of the ocean. And then the two countries are wired to each other. Here's another illustration that you can see. The American here on the west kind of looks like Uncle Sam. The Niagara is the ship. And then our friends across the pond there shaking hands. And you can see the electricity, the electronic communication across the Atlantic. Spooky message from 1861. First telegraph sent from California to the East Coast. May the Union be perpetual. That's what was sent because they knew it was coming. And here's telegraph operators in the Civil War in the Union Army. So just like, you know, there were technicians, you know, people that had very skilled trades. And you can see it was moved by horse and wagon. And field operators here um, operating a telegraph at the front. You could wire your field station that would go back to a main telegraph line that could go back all the way to the capital. And so in theory, if everything was working right and the wires had been laid correctly and, and things were working, Ulysses S. Grant in Tennessee on the front had instantaneous telecommunications with Abraham Lincoln. And we have examples of telegraph messages that are being sent. We were hit this morning, we're reforming, we're going to hit them again. And here's uh, Grant writing out a script to be sent by telegraph. So here's Grant seated, seated here. He's scratching down um, what he wants to be sent. And he's going to have a guy use electronic mail for him, send it back to uh, either Henry Halleck, uh, his, his uh, superior in St. Louis, or it's going to go back to Lincoln. And Union soldiers laying down wire. My grandfather did this in World War II, so they're still doing this, laying down wire on a battlefield to communicate with superiors. And you can see there's a battle going on in the background here, but we can see the telegraphs are set up here. In the Civil War is when we're going to have the onset of what we call telephone poles. Now, they're telegraph poles now, and then they become telephone poles, and then they become TV poles, and then a lot of them are now underground. I grew up, like you, like you heard, I grew up in Pittsburgh where there's trees galore everywhere. It's beautiful and wonderful until it starts raining and it just takes one tree to fall over and now all the power's out. <laughs> so everything's underground now. Uh, and you can see the, tele the telegraph poles being set up. So this started during the Civil War. And just for fun, I put in a Marconi machine because we mentioned that. This is a reproduction of the Marconi machine that was on the Titanic. And remember, this is a wireless telecommunications device. One of the 100 things that went wrong on that night in April 1912 is the operators turned the machine off about 10 o'clock. All these messages were coming in. Danger, danger, ice, ice, large iceberg sighted. Hundred things went wrong that night. This is just one of them. But they did have this. This technology did exist. And Arabella um, passed away the year before the Titanic. So her life, you know, here she is, uh, is connected to a lot of these things. So here's Arabella Mansfield, and here she is on the cover in 1969 of the Women Lawyers Journal. Professor Hasselmeyer here at Iowa Wesleyan in 1869, took on the task of proving 100 years later, because yes, this isn't just what we say at Iowa Westland to make us feel good. It's actually true 
And it turns out it is true, and the National Women Lawyers Association recognized Arabella. It went all the way up to President Nixon, and Nixon recognized that, yes, Arabella is, in fact, the first female lawyer in the United States. She was born in 1846 near Burlington, the first year in the year that Iowa became a state. Her family, though, the Babb family, did go to California. Her father, though, is going to die in a cave-in in California in the gold rush, and they're going to return to Iowa, and they come back to Mount Pleasant. And she attends Mount Pleasant during the Civil War, so all these random things that we're talking about, they're starting to come together. In 1862, she's at Iowa Wesleyan. Her brother, Washington Irving Babb, goes to the front. He joins the Iowa Cavalry, and he goes off into Grant's Army. Here we go. In 1866, she graduates from Iowa Wesleyan the first time with her brother. Her brother came back from the war in 1865. He went back to school, and the two of them graduated the same year. And then after she graduated, she started basically working for an Ambler Law Office in town with her brother. And in 1869, she took the exam. Her husband, the professor here, Professor Mansfield, also took the exam, so they both passed on the same day. And then in 1870, she got her master's degree from Iowa Wesleyan. And she's also now going to chair the Iowa Women's Enfranchisement Association. So she's involved in all kinds of things. And, you know, it might seem strange. And in the 1870s, she's a professor. She's a professor here. She goes, she goes to Simpson College for a year or two, and then she goes eventually to DePauw and teaches there. And then she became a world traveler, went to Europe. She even went to Japan. And here's basically the view out the window there. So old, I, um, old Main and then Pioneer Hall. And these eastern, these, I was a park ranger, these beautiful eastern white pines. They're still here. So those two trees are still here. In the 1830s, um, the first pioneers come here to the area that's going to become, become Mount Pleasant. And it might seem strange. How does a female in the 1860s become the first lawyer, the first female lawyer in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And then how does she go to being in women's enfranchisement and then a professor and all these very progressive things. And when you, you look at Mount Pleasant in a wider context, it actually makes perfect sense. In 1842, Within 10 years of the first pioneers being here, the Mount Pleasant Collegiate Institute is uh, established. So right away, education's on everybody's mind. Howe's Academy is built. There's all kinds of academies that are being put up. There's an anti-slavery newspaper in the 1850s. It's a center of anti-slavery uh, activity here, and just south and south. Uh, Salem, I'm sure a lot of you know that there is an underground railroad station there. Uh, Mr. Harlan, the president of this college, is voted into uh, the United States Senate, goes to Washington. Mr. Harlan goes to Washington as an abolitionist, a friend of Abraham Lincoln. He becomes a rising star in the Republican Party. The Asbury Methodist Church, which is now an uh, apartment on Monroe Street, the building is still standing. It's not a church anymore. It was built in 1857, and that was considered one of the most beautiful churches west of the Mississippi River. So very early on, Mount Pleasant is a center of education and Methodism. You put those two together, and you're going to have all kinds of progress. And that's in the middle of the 19th century, <coughs> ingredients for very uh, progressive attitudes was this combination of education and Methodism, and you have them both right here. Uh, in 1860, we have the asylum, and when you look at today, you know what they would do in the asylum 
it's not what people would do in an asylum today. However, for 1860, it's extremely advanced. For instance, they didn't allow smoking. I mean, where else in 1860 did they say, you can't smoke here, it's not good for your health? Nowhere else did they do that. Think about it. What were people who had mental illness, how were they being treated before asylums? They're just being locked in basements, locked in cellars, put away in attics. And now the state of Iowa is being very progressive, and Mount Pleasant in particular, hosting one of these asylums. There was a public statement that we need to figure out what to do. We can't just lock people up in basements anymore. In 1865, Harlan signs the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery. And then in 1869, just a few years later, Arabella passes the bar exam. So all these things happen in the 1860s. And it fits that she would be here in very much a hotbed of progressivism. So just another, so abolitionism was present in Mount Pleasant, and then with Arabella you have women's enfranchisement. Who was the third sister of progress in the 19th century? They all go together. They're in one kit and caboodle. There's abolitionism. There's women's enfranchisement. What's the third one? It's probably the biggest one of them all. Temperance movement. So Arabella is also involved in the temperance movement. We're going to end slavery. We're going to give women the same opportunities as men. And then we're going to really clean up our society by getting rid of these taverns and saloons and getting people off of alcohol. There was rampant alcoholism in the 19th century, just rampant, and it was destroying families. It's probably the number one cause of spousal abuse, child abuse. Dad's coming home drunk, drinking away all the money. There's a good illustration of this. If you ever read Frank McCourt's Angel of the Ashes, which is about 1930s in Ireland, that gives you kind of an insight into how widespread and pervasive alcoholism probably was in the 19th century. And the dad goes to the St. Paul's and the Vincent Society and drinks away all the bread money. Here we are in Mount Pleasant in the middle of the country. On June 15th, Arabella passes the bar exam. Three days later, it's in the newspaper. Now these newspapers, a lot of them are weeklies. They just come out once a week, and so it's going to take a few days for a story to get in. Mount Pleasant Journal is going to pick it up. Here's the first paper, and you guys have this on your sheet. The Athens of Iowa Ahead. So three days after Arabella passes the bar exam, she's in the newspaper. During the term of the district court held in the city, the fore part of the preset week, Mrs. Bell A. Mansfield, A.B. of this city, was admitted to the bar and authorized to practice in the courts of the state. Mrs. M. is a young married lady about 24 years of age, is a graduate of Iowa Wesleyan University and a lady of strong mind. That she has the brains and ability necessary to make a good record for herself is the choice that no one will dispute. We presume that Mrs. M. is the first lady admitted to practice law in the state. It's actually in the whole country. And she must expect to be stared at and remarked upon all occasions, for you know, a female lawyer in the state of Iowa is something new. It's new everywhere. So it's just, it's fun to read this stuff. Her husband, Professor J. M. Mansfield, was also admitted at this time. We do not know the intentions of this couple, but if they see fit to swing out their shingle, we wish them a great success. So, kudos. And then the second local newspaper is going to pick it up a week later, the Henry County Press. So in the first week, it's still here in Mount Pleasant. And then 10 days later, it's 423 miles away. The Nashville Union picks it up. 
This is the Nashville Union and American. It picks up the same story. Athens of Iowa ahead. So the same story is in Nashville, Tennessee. Remember, this is just after the Civil War. <laughs> Those crazy Yankees. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but then just after two weeks, uh, just 15 days after, it's in the New York Daily Tribune. So 920 miles this went in less than two weeks. And if you flip your, over your sheet, this one's really funny. I, unfortunately, I couldn't have the whole thing. Uh, it's petticoats at the bar. <laughs> the other day, Mrs. Arabella, Arabella Mansfield, a young lady of 24, was admitted to practice in the courts of Iowa. We are heartily glad of it, for we dare say there are many functions of an attorney for which Mrs. Mansfield is admirably qualified. There is no reason in the world why the great bulk of what is now known as office work in the legal profession should not be performed by women. And of course, whatever enlarges women's opportunities of earning an honest living without detracting from her natural position in society must be looked upon as a benefit to the community at large. Mrs. Mansfield's husband was admitted to practice at the same time. And we presumed that the pair might make a very efficient firm under the title Mansfield and Husband, or Mansfield and Wife, according to circumstances. We do not recommend them to open separate offices because they might happen to be engaged on opposite sides of the same cause, and one of the two might have no better ground to go upon than abuse of the opposite counsel, which would lead to unpleasant domestic consequences. <laughs> but if Mrs. Mansfield will mind the office while Mr. M attends to the courts, Perhaps no two other lawyers in Iowa may be able to compete with them. <laughs> and it actually, you know, I wish I could have included the whole thing because it gets even better about how, how you know, the, the, this is, it's going to be really hard for a lady to stand in front of a, a, a judge. And is she going to be able to reprimand a witness? That sort of thing. So. There she is. Got petticoats at the bar. And then, uh, just after two weeks, July 1, it's in the Daily Evening Telegraph in Philadelphia. So it's all on the East Coast. Another funny thing is, it's the New York City paper that's making jokes about the lady lawyer, and it's the Midwesterners that are totally okay with it. So we're okay with this, this progressive uh, feeling here but it's the big East Coast cities that are making jokes about it. And that's something to kind of uh, keep in mind, you know. And then July 2nd, just after two weeks, the story appears in the Union and Journal in Biddeford, Maine. And again, within a month, before the month has gone out, the Portland Daily Press. And here's the uh, Portland Daily Press, putting uh, this in, this is just one month afterwards. And they, again, the East Coasters, they put petticoats at the bar, but uh, July 14, 1869, less than a month afterwards, it's all the way, way up in New England. And then the capital um, by the fall, we've now jumped to November. And these are the, just the ones that are available to find. It could be that there's other newspapers that just are not uh, surviving or extent in any kind of archive, but 784 miles to Washington, D.C. And then it starts to get down south in South Carolina, Anderson and Tellinger, Anderson, South Carolina, November 18th. And then finally, we go all the way in December 18th to Shasta Courier in Shasta, California. That's 1,600 miles. So Within that first year was in 1869. There were stories of Arabella Bass Mansfield in the East Coast and way out west. And there's a ton in the center, but uh, I, I just figured we'd do the ones that were the furthest distant. And I love this. This is the one line she gets in the Shasta, California, but it's there. Mrs. Arabella Mansfield, Esquire, is the beauty of the Iowa bar. <laughs>
largely because of all these technological advances that have happened. A lot of these newspapers are going to have the word telegraph in it, like the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Wire, and that's referring to the Samuel Morse invention. And they would have sometimes from the telegraph on the side, and these were these bullet points that were coming in from all over the country. And it could take a few months for the story to move around, but because of the existence of these long-distance communications and the existence of railroad, people just moving place to place more easily by word of mouth, stories were no longer just local. So Arabella in 1869 was known in New York City, and she was known way out in California. Thank you very much. Any questions? To what extent is it all did the Civil War open up opportunities for women like World War II did? You know, that's a really good question. Did the Civil War open up opportunities for women? So you're going to have, by 1865, you're going to have a million men in the Union Army. There's 30 million people in the United States. Half of them are in the Confederacy. And then you figure out that a million of the remainder in the North are off on the front. There's going to be more opportunities for females. So it is sort of like that. Now, in the 19th century, I think we get sort of thrown off by recent history. The 1950s and the early 1960s, the baby boomers grew up in a period where there was a very strict nuclear family. Dad went to work, mom was at home. That was kind of like a new thing, I think. If you go back a few more generations, just because of the necessities of farm work, the necessities of labor, females were actually doing a lot. Now, in terms of professional work, you are going to see openings for more females. Teaching is going to be the big one. That's going to be the big one. Teaching and nursing are going to be the big ones. So you probably have to wait a couple more generations after the Civil War for more things to open. But it's more open than it was before. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Yeah. In your research, did you find any comments about her mother, noticing that her mother was widowed in 1860 when she was 14? The struggles of her mother to provide for her children must have had a big influence on her being so strongly independent. And did most of this independence come directly from her mother? Yeah, you know, I have not run into anything specific about her mother. But yes, as you surmised, you can imagine being your spouse has died. You're a mother. You have children. It's 1852. You live in California. You grew up in Iowa. What are you going to do? You can't just hop on an airplane. So you've got to come back. She comes back to Iowa. I'm wondering if she had to come back for family. But I'd have to look that up. I'd have to do more research on that. But yes, you would imagine that this was probably in the family, that she got this from something. Yeah, yeah. Growing up without a father changes you. Yeah, yeah. Just what is the technology? I kind of suspect the U.S. mail sent the story to New York State. Or was it over the telegraph? So, you know, that's a good question. Does it go by mail? The thing is, mail is – there's going to be this famous Pony Express, which existed for a very short period of time. And then the combination of the railroad and the telegraph basically makes a Pony Express obsolete. It was very famous, but it wasn't around for very long. And it was just faster to wire stories. The mail service – you know, of course it existed, but it wasn't as large as it was now. And it was probably easier and faster to wire information. Now, you could, you know, of course mail letters, but you don't have to look that up. It would just depend on the different circumstances. It's probably a mixture of the two. Any other questions? Wow. You guys are great. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.
you, Jeff, for coming and sharing all that information with us. So just a reminder, next week we will not have a lecture here, but our fourth and final brown bag of March will be March 29th, and we'll feature Rich Heilman. Um, in the meantime, I have brochures over on the table there if you're interested in becoming a member or volunteering. And as always, we have a donation box if you're interested in helping out the house today. So thank you so much for attending, both in person and virtually. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you. This is sort of the backwards announcement. <clears throat> Our soloist is in the building. Um, but she's upstairs eating, so we're going to try to get her to come on down or something. Yeah, if you hang on, hang around a little while.